Welcome everybody. It is lesson seven of God wrote a book. Today in lesson seven, we're going to be talking about the writing of many books. And this is a fun one. We're going to be covering uh, quite a bit of just really helpful information to know about how it is that we have our New Testament, why we have our New Testament, why it is uh, it, it was done in the way it was done, and the value uh, that that brings to us in the abundance of God's uh, word at our fingertips today. So before we get started, we are going to uh, start with prayer and be able to um, get this uh, Bible study going. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to gather together here together virtually, although we are before you wherever we are, and we're grateful for the work that you've done in preserving your word for us so that we would know the truth today, so we would have the mystery completely revealed from Genesis to Revelation, and we are thankful for that, Lord. We pray you'll bless today's study, that those who attend uh, will learn more about the work that you have done to preserve your word and this will be an opportunity for everyone to grow in their understanding of the preservation of the word of god and how we can be confident and the word that we have today is the preserved word that you have done for us we pray this all and ask you to bless this time in jesus christ's name amen all right amen i don't know who eats right during back. prayer time but wow that's pretty crazy all right, Matthew dot 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 thirty four. I don't know why they got dot dot dotted. Amen, amen. Maybe you can get a job in the VR department at Arc. You know, it's funny. I've thought about that, um, and I'm gonna actually hit uh, Steve Ham up to see if that's something that might be an option. So, but to the lesson. Lesson seven: the writing of many books. Uh, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added for you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is the day, is its own trouble. Amen, amen. We didn't just hear that. We did just hear that because that's a verse that mom and dad have been thinking about a lot. So you can count on that. Okay, introduction. In this lesson, we are going to learn about how the New T Testament books came to be written and then circulated. We will also learn how the documents were copied and transmitted. We are going to learn how documents were copied and transmitted. The writing of books. The occasions for books uh, to be written were often, uh, regarding the New Testament books, were usually to address certain needs, answers, questions, or to communicate some truth. For instance, uh, the Gospels. And we have Luke. 1 through 4 ESV. Luke 1, 1 through 4 ESV. Yes, somebody's mic's a little close to a fan or um, something's going on there. So we have Luke 1, 1 through 4. Inasmuch as we have undertaken to compile a narrative of things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word having been delivered to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, he writes to make a theological argument to Theophilus. In the book of Acts, it picks, he picks up the pen and continues from the book of Luke to show how all the things that Jesus continued to do and teach went through the book of Acts. Luke was all about what Jesus began, and the book of Luke, that is, is all about what Jesus began, and Acts is all about those things continuing to be done and taught through his apostles. Now, there are various reasons why New Testament books were written. Understanding the teaching or meaning of any of those New Testament books requires some understanding of the purpose of those books being written, which is why we always begin with a study of the New Testament books with a little bit of background. Looking at who the author is, why it was written, when it was written, and to whom it was written. This is called the hermeneutics of Scripture. And so various New Testament books have different purposes. 
for example, the epistles. We're going to look at Acts 1, 1 through 3. Acts 1, 1 through 3. That is to show what Jesus continued to do and teach. Uh, Acts 1, 1 through 3 says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now we have the book of Galatians. What was its purpose? To correct false doctrines. The book of Galatians was written to correct these false doctrines. The book of Ephesians was a cyclical letter written to various churches intended to be generic and not to address any specific church, but to be circulated through all the churches of Asia Minor, which would have included Ephesus, Thyatira, and Pergamum, and some of those other churches in the area. Ephesians is, I said, a, a cyclical letter written to these various churches, and it was intended to address generic issues. Not a specific church, but it was sent to all these different churches, and they were to copy it and give it to each other as a, a generic epistle. Philippians was a thank you letter written from Paul from the church of or to the church of Philippi for supporting him and encouraging him and sending him Aphrodite uh, to minister to his needs. Colossians was intended to address the Gnostic heresy. We have uh, Romans, which explains the gospel and prepares the way for Paul's visit. We have 1 Corinthians to correct the practice of the church and answer their questions. We have 2 Corinthians, which was written to defend Paul's apostleship and his apostolic authority against those who were attacking and slandering him. And then we have uh, Philemon uh, was simply a personal letter to uh, return a slave to his master and appeal for the kindness of his master. Each book of the Old Testament and New Testament had an occasion for its writing. What is magnificent is how each of the, those books, with its unique purpose and its unique intended audience and its unique time and occasion for writing, could all end up being gathered together and collected together into what we have today in the Old and New Testament. It is quite a feat that God has accomplished in collecting these books together as they are and handling them or and handing them today to us. We have the entire Old Testament and New Testament collection for us today. That is an amazing accomplishment of God. And it's magnificent how he has done it. Each of the each I'm sorry, even a book like Philemon, written from Paul to Philemon, carried by once Onesimus. I always want to say Onesimus, but that's his name. It's not a, it's Onesimus. Uh, so initially, there were three people who were privy to that one letter: Paul, Philemon, and Onesimus. Yes, Rachel. What does privy mean? Uh, that means they had access to it. Like it's kind of like privacy, but it's meaning privy. They had they had access to it, but it was a limited access. So there's only three people who knew about that letter. That was it. And now, because of one personal letter written to another person and carried by a third party, today we benefit from that book and we have it in our canon. It's quite magnificent that God would find a way to preserve it for us and it was not lost to history, especially considering how many uh, personal letters and correspondence have been lost in ancient history. It is quite magnificent, and, and that that is such an important thing to think about. Magnificent that we have all that we do. Praise God. Of course, we have what we do because God has promised to preserve what he had intended for his people to have today. So let's talk about the circulation of books. And by the way, if you have questions while we're going through this, don't, don't hesitate to ask. That's why it's a interactive study. So the church recognized apostolic um, authority and followed their doctrine. In Acts 2.42, Acts 2.42, 
They were continually devoting, them, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Notice, they being the early disciples. So, letters and books were read by Christians in public assembly. What I want you to see now is how the New Testament books came to be written and came to be circulated. There is a theology behind why it is that early Christians circulated the books of the New Testament and copied them. Let's see what the theology is and see it from the pages of the New Testament itself. So we're going to reference a bunch of scriptures here. So letters and books were written by Christians, or, I'm sorry, were read by Christians in the public assembly. 1 Timothy 4.13, 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. 1 Thessalonians 5.27, 1 Thessalonians 5.27, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. Now, when it's saying all the brethren, that is the assembly of the church. That's what he's referring to. Paul says to Timothy, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. And then he says concerning his own writings, I want you to publicly read this to the congregation. Question, what would this tell us about Paul's view of his own writings? If he's saying, I want you to have this read to all the congregation, what do you think it means that Paul thought about his own writings? He's very confident in it. Confident in it being what? True. True. He knew it was scripture. Biblically sound. It was scripture. Paul regarded his own writings as scripture. Second Thessalonians 3.14. 2 Thessalonians 3.14. If anyone does not obey our instructions in this letter, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he will be put to shame. Question, Paul expected his, com his commands to be obeyed. Why? Is it scripture? Because he was an apostle that carried apostolic authority, and what he wrote he considered to be authoritative. 2 Timothy 1.13 2 Timothy 1.13 Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Second, or I'm sorry, Titus 2.15. Titus 2.15. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Paul encouraged Titus to have his words used to speak and exhort and reprove the people that were in the church at the island of Crete with all authority. Paul is making it clear that this is an authoritative letter. 2 Timothy 3 backs this up. All scripture is for reproving of people, and his own letters are used for that. Paul viewed his own writings on par with scripture. Okay. Letters and books by apostles were recognized as scripture. Notice we're going through this rather quickly, so if you guys have questions, let me know. Paul claimed divine inspiration for his own writings. 1 Corinthians 14.37 1 Corinthians 14.37 If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. There is Paul claiming divine authority for his own writings, his own apostolic writings. Wow, thanks for the cheer, dude. Appreciate that. Uh, you got to do a one, not an I. So 1 Corinthians 14, 37 would be it. Instead of an I, you want that as a one where the I is. Appreciate that, right? Thank you. All right. Apostolic writings carried divine authority in the church. Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, and 13, 7. We're not going to read those right now, but we are going to read 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3.2. 2 Peter 3.2. That's
that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Notice how Peter puts the commandments of the apostles on par with the writings of the holy prophets. Peter recognized Paul's epistles as scripture. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which there are some hard things to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. Notice what Peter is saying here. He talks about Paul's writings and says the wicked distort them just as they do the rest of scriptures. Now, that means that Peter viewed Paul's writings as scripture. Uh, yeah, these are all in NASB from um, the... Uh, lesson that Jim put together. He does all his quotes out of the NSB. Letters and books were gathered into collections. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16. Uh, that's the one we already did, so you can just keep that one up right there. Peter refers to Paul's letters, plural. It seems that Peter knew of multiple letters Paul had written, and Paul's letters were regarded as scripture in the early church and by other apostles. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's a question for you. Did the apostles understand that what they were writing was Holy Scripture? What do you think? Did they understand it? You are correct. They did. Here's why they would have expected that. If there had been an old covenant, as there was, and the giving of that old covenant was accompanied by revelation to explain the significance of the old covenant and the old covenant had passed away and God has now instituted a new covenant. What would we expect if the old covenant was accompanied by old Testament writings, we would expect some instructions and explanations for the new covenant. Would we expect that you bet? And the apostles were promised that the Spirit of God would be active in their writings and understandings. Uh, for example, in as John 16 stated, and the apostles had every reason to expect that, the, that they, being messengers of Christ, with the ability to do signs and wonders, would themselves be instruments of divine revelation. Doesn't mean they were, uh, this doesn't mean they weren't humble. It simply means they understood their calling in the plan of God, that they would be a vehicle through which divine revelation would come connected to the new covenant. So they expected the Christians in every church to regard their writings as apostolic, as authoritative, as divine revelation, and to treat those writings as such. And the early church did just that. Okay, letters and books were circulated as widely and as quickly as possible. Okay, you said ESV at the start. Sorry, uh, Nathaniel, please forgive me. Corinthians 4.16. Corinthians 4.16 NASB. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. All right, let's think about this. Hopefully you'll put Colossians 4.16 up there. Yo. All right. So as you can see from Colossians 4.16, there is an instruction from the Apostle Paul that when his letter is read among you, not note he's assuming that this letter is going to be read in the church. That when the letter is read among you, you are to find the one 
that Paul sent to the Laodicean church, and you get that letter and have that letter read in your assembly as well. The Laodiceans letter, most people believe, was the book of Ephesians that we now call Ephesians. That was the one that was considered in reference to the Laodicean letter from Scripture here. A general epistle not written with specific church in mind, circulated widely among the churches as the book of Ephesians, has all the hallmarks of that. And thank you for posting that here. I appreciate it. So, how this looked in reality and how it was circulated and regarded as scripture. This is a little scenario for you guys to kind of think about how this circulation thing might have happened. All right. A book was written or letter and commonly, uh, uh, sorry, in a common commercial language, uh, Ephesians, for example, able to be widely and quickly understood because everybody could read it and circulated. These books would be read and reread, accepted as scripture and treated as such. What do Christians do when they have scripture? We cherish it. We preach it. We teach it. We study it, memorize it, discuss it, and commentate on it. We want everyone to have access to it. We want everyone's lives to be changed by it. We don't hide it. We don't put it in the basement of a monastery and hide it away from the world. Hmm, who does that sound like? We, we want it out and exposed to the people so that their lives will be transformed by it. That's how we view scripture. That's how Christians view scripture today. And that's how Christians viewed scripture in the early church. Okay, so books or letters would be read and reread in the worship service. Service. They would be circulated quickly and widely because they were treated in and regarded as scripture. So you can imagine in a city like Ephesus, which is a major city at the time, imagine you were there and last week you received a letter from the Apostle Paul. We're going to read it publicly for all of us. It would be heard by visitors either being discussed in the marketplace or at service. A visitor might say, hey, uh, my church back home could really use to hear this letter. Do you mind if I make a copy of, of it and take it with me? The answer, of course, would be yes, sure do. Just want the letter. Uh, do you just want that letter? Or do you want all the letters that we have that Paul has written? We have a letter he wrote to Romans, one of the churches in Galatia, and we have a copy of the one he wrote to the Corinthians. We hear there is another, and we have sent one of our deacons to copy it. The church in Philippi has a copy of the other one from Corinthians. So, we also have a biography of Jesus written in Paul's by Paul's traveling companion, Dr. Luke. Wow, I'll copy that if I can, they would say. Letters and books would be copied by hand. They would be given papyrus and parchment and a quill and ink to go with it. Large cities would find collections of various books easier to acquire faster because of the large amount of traffic, visitors, and of money going on there. Manuscript evidence suggests that collections were bound together, even within Paul's own lifetime. They might say, I've got a copy of Paul's letters to the Galatians, and pull that one out, and I've been carrying it, uh, carrying this around with me. Do you have this one? And they would say, no, we don't. You let me have Ephesians, and I'll let you copy Galatians. And they would copy those by hand. That is how the early manuscripts were copied and distributed widely. Big cities with lots of traffic would have been the places where they would begin to gather. Because you would have people from all over the Roman Empire traveling to these cities and have access to the ever-growing collections of ap apostolic documents before they would leave and then go back to their church with those copies. You might go back to their church and say, hey, when I was in Athens, they had seven of Paul's epistles there in Athens and a gospel from a guy 
named Mark, who traveled with the apostle Peter. It's Peter's gospel. And this would not just have happened with Paul's letters, but with Peter's letters, John's letters, all the gospels, and the books of Acts, etc. Very cool to think about. Exactly. That's why we have this scenario. It's kind of neat. Those documents that were regarded as scripture were copied and circulated widely and put into collections, and the church valued them as scripture. As people came and went, you can see the motive behind that, to quickly duplicate these and spread them as widely as possible, because Christians had a hunger for apostolic writings because they regarded them as scripture. Question. Did they verify their authenticity? Answer. It would have been something that was accepted widely amongst various churches. For instance, the church of Philippi would have known that the letter came from Paul because it would have come from a messenger. You'll notice that when you read through 1 Corinthians and Philippians, uh, they were sent by the hands of Titus, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. Uh, did you have a question? Um, yes. You said, did they verify their... I said, how did they verify their authenticity? Okay, I heard did. No, I said, well, why I, I meant to say, how did they verify their authenticity? Okay. And they did that, first of all, by the messenger they received it from. There were various messengers for the apostles, and they had, uh, that would accompany them uh, with their documents and certify, hey, this came from Paul, I'm his messenger. So it would have so it wouldn't have to be directly delivered by Paul to authenticate it. The churches authenticated the certification. Paul would talk about how he would certify his own writing, saying, Look at the large letters with which I have written to you. And when someone would write on his behalf, and he would certify that to the churches to bear testimony that it was delivered by a messenger on behalf of of Paul. I love all these. Helps me explain that the Bible exactly. That's that is why this is such a cool study. It helps us understand why the the scripture itself gives us the understanding that it was it was self-validating in um in some of the ways that Paul signed it. Like you read that one, look at these large letters that's actually in the letter that he signed it with and now we understand why they were authentic authenticating that those were genuine letters from Paul. There were documents that Paul makes mention of that Thessalonians do not be distributed as if by a letter from us that was coming of the Lord had already come. I guess there were some false letters that had gone around. There was someone circulating letters supposedly coming from Paul, pseudo epistles that supposedly came from Paul's own hand that warned the church that Paul was warning the church about. There were ways that he would sign his own letters so that the churches would understand that it came from him or from other apostles. Um, Paul wanted to guard the authenticity and integrity of his own writings and warn against other false writings. Apparently one of the ones that was false was saying that Christ had already come. So, here's a question. How did the early church decide what was scripture? Anybody? How did the early church decide what was scripture? Because God told them to write it. No, like God told the apostles. Mm. How did the early church decide what was scripture? Andy, you have a guess? I don't know. Sounds like it was a, organic. It was a bit of a trick question because they didn't. The early church yeah. didn't decide what was scripture. They discovered what was scripture. God, writing it, chose which books were scripture. It was God who decided which books were scripture. The task of the early church was not to decide which books uh, they would regard as, as scripture but to discover which ones God had actually written. There is a process behind that. And once you understand the process, 
uh, was, of course, a divine... Um, sorry. Once you understand the process, you'll understand that the Da Vinci Code and other such movies or books that try to uh, cause concern about hidden things of God's Word and stuff like that are complete nonsense. Uh, those movies and, and ideas go straight out the window when you understand the process by which the church discovered the, the scriptures. We do not determine the books that are, are in the canon. God did. Um, and we will cover that in later lessons. And it's pretty cool how that's done. Okay. The Spirit of God was present at the time, by the way, and certifying what books were scripture in those early churches. All right. Now we have an objection. Some critics will say that not all Christians recognized all of the New Testament uh, or all of the books of the New Testament as scripture from the beginning. This is a true statement. Not all Christians would have recognized all 27 books of the New Testament as scripture from the beginning. It might shock you, but it took a bit of time before the second and third John were recognized as scriptures, Hebrews, and even Revelation. They were not widely regarded as scripture to start with. Now, we're not talking about a couple of weeks. We're talking about decades before it was widely accepted. Now, does that disturb you? It shouldn't. We're used to things instantly happening today. That was not the way it was in the ancient world. It did take a little bit of time before the 27 books were widely expect, uh, accepted. What do you think might explain that? Well, there are two answers. Number one, some did not know that certain books even existed. You know, you go up to your church and you say, hey, uh, do you, do you know the, the book of Hebrews is scripture? You know, like, I haven't seen the book of Hebrews. I don't know what you're talking about. It can't be scripture. I don't have it. That would be a reason. They don't have that book. The second one is, if they knew they existed and the authorship could be established, then they were accepted. Book of Hebrews is a good example. It took a while for that to be accepted as scripture. Any idea why the book of Hebrews specifically? Well, we don't know who wrote it. We don't know. We don't doubt it today. But as you can clearly see the work, because you can clearly see the work of the Holy Spirit of God on every page of Hebrews. But it would take a little while for all Christians to accept that. The wideness and rapidity which were they were circulated would have affect their acceptance of it. It would take time for it to be distributed to the extents of the, to the full extents of the Roman Empire. Now my headset is about to die, so if we um, if the game crashes, I'll log right back in again and we'll continue. I'm just going to keep going for as long as it will last. Hopefully, I get another half hour out of it. I don't know. Just gave me a warning. All right, the copying of books. There was a need to make this many copies. Why? Well, originals needed to replace, be replaced from much use. Some were very well used before being copied. Others were copied very quickly after being received. Some manuscripts were never copied before it ended up being destroyed by any number of different ways. Some manuscripts had a very few copies made and some had many copies made. Yes? How would they tell which one was the copy and which one was the original? That's a good question. We'll cover that in a little bit. Some had many copies made. Uh, there is a discipline called lower criticism. And this would answer your question. Lower criticism is the discipline of looking at ancient manuscripts and determining by which type of copying trains does that manuscript come from. Which one came first? Which one came second? It's called lower criticism. And it's actually a discipline that people learn. Was this a manuscript that was the third or fourth generation? Or was the manuscript that was the tenth generation? Or was it really close to the original? Those scholars whose hands who handle that ancient manuscript and determine those things that were this is called lower criticism. And it's a good discipline and one that is healthy for the early church. Now there's another discipline called higher criticism 
and it is not healthy. It's when somebody says things like, well, we don't think Paul wrote the letter of Timothy. They're just throwing it out there. That's higher criticism, and it's liberal theology. Lower criticism is really looking at the forensics of the manuscript to know when and how they were copied. Now, I hope this doesn't shock you, but I'm going to say something that you need to be thoughtful about. We have no original manuscripts in our possession. None. Now, does that bother you? We do have, I'm sorry, we do not have the actual piece of paper that the Apostle Paul wrote on with his sweat and his tears and his DNA. We don't have it. Sounds gross. <laughs> Why'd you want that? The point is we can't authenticate it. It, ha it does, We don't have the piece of paper with his original handwriting on it. We do not have any of the original writings of Paul's <laughs> letters or any of the original apostles. These are referred to as the original autographs. Um, yes, autographs. The original autographs. We don't have any of them. Gasps. Yes, Jim says gasps. Um, we do not have any of the original autographs. That is not just for the New Testament, by the way. That is true for all the ancient documents. We don't have the original document for Homer or Caesar, the Iliad, or any of those books. All Any of the ancient authors we don't have the original documents for. How, then... Do we know that what we have today is what was originally written? We don't have any originals of any ancient document. We don't need the originals to know what was written, as you will see in the coming weeks. We're going to go over this in great detail, how we can know uh, that we have what, the original, what was originally penned. Now, God did not intend to preserve the original. God didn't need to preserve the original. He had a better process. Uh, the power of copy consensus. Spoilers! Okay, here we're going to talk about the process of copying. The Talmudus period from 100 AD to 500 AD. The Old Testament was copied by Talmudists. That ten times fast. They laid down a strict guidelines for copying manuscripts. I'm going to read to you the process by which the testaments were copied from, and this is a, a book written by Geyser and Nix, and it's called From God to Us. Sounds like an interesting book if you want to know about textual transmission. These are described as the guidelines of how to copy books for the Talmudists. All right, here we go. This is from their book, a quote from their book here. A synagogue roll must be written on the skins of clean animals, prepared for the particular use from or of that synagogue by a Jew. These must be fastened together with strings taken from clean animals. Every skin must contain a certain number of columns equal throughout the entire codex remember codex is the word for book now a little commentary here they've described the types of skin to be used no pig skin for example these had to be clean animals the skins had to be prepared by a jew and fastened together into a codex by strings taken from clean animals now this is back to the book the length of each column must not extend over less than 48 or more than 60 lines. And the breadth must consist of 30 letters. The columns were justified. Remember we talked about that? There's kind of an example on the back wall there that they are justified by 30 letters. The whole copy must be first lined. And if three words were written without a line, it is worthless and would be scrapped. The ink should be black, neither red, green, nor any other color, and be prepared according to a definite recipe. 
an authentic copy must be exemplar. Exemplar means perfect from each transcriber ought not to have the least deviate. The copy with which you're copying from must be in fantastic condition. No word or letter, not even a tittle, must be written from memory. Everything must be transcribed by looking at it. It says, the scribe not having looked at the codex before him. That means they can't be like, oh, I remember what I'm writing. I'll just write it from memory. They have to actually look at it and they're going to write exactly what they see. Between every consonant, the space of a hair or thread must intervene. Between every paragraph or section, the breadth of nine consonants. Between every book, three lines. The fifth book of Moses must terminate exactly with a line, but the rest need not do so. Besides this, the copyist must sit in full Jewish dress, wash his whole body, and not begin to write the name of God with a pen newly dipped in ink. And should the king address him while writing that name, he must take no notice of him. Wow, these are some crazy requirements, right? Why would they not want the name of God to be written with a pen newly dipped in ink? So it wouldn't make a blob at the beginning of the word. So you had to be so fastidious in copying that those manuscripts, that when they had, had started the name of God, they would have to pace themselves in such a way that they didn't need to dip their pink, dip their pink, dip their pen in ink uh, to with, for fresh ink when they started his name. So you can only imagine how slowly it would take to make these copies when you would go through that much detail. Do you have a question? All right. So that was how the Talmudists would copy it. Now, the next was the Masoretic period. This is from 580 to 900 AD. The Masoretics treated the text with the greatest imaginable reverence and devised a complicated system of safeguards against scribal slips. Sir Frederick, I'm sorry, Sir Frederick Kenyon, an expert of ancient manuscripts, says this following from his book. Besides recording varieties of reading, tradition, and conjecture, the Masorets undertook a number of calculations which do not enter into the ordinary sphere of textual criticism. They numbered the verses, words, letters of every book. They calculated the middle word and the middle letter of each. They enumerated verses which contained all the letters of the alphabet or a certain number of them and so on. These trivialities, as may rightly, as many may rightly consider them, had yet the effect of securing minute attention to the precise transmission of the text. And they are but an excessive manifestation of a respect for the sacred scriptures, which in itself deserves noting, deserves nothing but praise. The Masoretes were indeed anxious that not one jot nor tittle, not one of the smallest letters, nor one tiny part of a letter of the law should pass away or be lost. Thank you, uh, Nathaniel, for whatever that was. So, they knew how many words were in every book that they copied. They knew what the center word was in the middle, in the middle letter of the book, so that when they finished a copy, they would go back, count the number of words, and they would count the number of letters and ensure that the middle letter in the middle of the book corresponded with the middle letter in the middle of the original book they were copying from. 
the new they knew which verse contained every letter of the alphabet that they were copying and they would mark them as they went through and that was the type of fastidious detail that they took in making those copies if you're paying that much attention in not only how you are copying but what the original product is as well as what the copies end up being how easy do you think it is for errors to creep in to that copying process this makes it way more difficult it's not foolproof but it makes it difficult for errors to creep in remember those who were copying these things were not malicious people who were trying to alter the text they had uh, they had the utmost reverence for the text they were copying and they wanted it to be faithful and true for they believed themselves to be the vehicles through which God was faithfully preserving his word. And they took this very seriously when they sat down to make a copy of something. These are people who were ancient Xeroxers and ancient photocopy machines. Even if they did have, oh, even if they did have it memorized, they didn't write it down from memory. Remember, one of the requirements was not allowed to write anything down from memory without checking first with the original. Okay, any questions about that? So the reliability of the copying process. Copies were made by people who had a high regard for the text and believed that they were doing that what they were doing was of the utmost importance. This was not done by people who had an agenda. Copies were made, checked, and often double checked. Unreliably copies were either destroyed or as Samuel Davidson notes, the roles in which these regulations are not observed are condemned to be buried in the ground or burned or they are banished to schools to be used for reading books. It took me a minute to figure out what he meant by that, banished to schools. So remember, we're talking about how they would um, take the inaccurate books and they wouldn't allow them to be read in the synagogues, but they would be allow them to basically be used in schools to teach how to read. And, and it would be understood that what they were reading was an inaccurate copy. But obviously so much effort and money and expense went in and there weren't a lot of books to be used to, to send them to a school was a blessing for the school to be able to use it to teach people how to read. But it was very well understood. It was not an authentic copy. They were deemed unfit for use for worship or for instruction. Why? They were not considered the word of God accurately given. So back to the question. Does it bother you that we don't have the original writings or the earlier copies? Because there's something very interesting here. Why did early Christians not preserve the originals? We have a way of valuing original autographs today, don't we? The early Christians didn't. Why? Why did the early Christians not value the original writings? Anybody have an idea? Anybody? Because they wouldn't last. That simple. I'm not bothered much because we have extensive copying. Exactly. They didn't value the original copies because they wouldn't last. There's two considerations. The early church and ancient Jews lived in a oral culture, not a written culture. Oral teaching and tradition was viewed as more reliable than written. In their thinking, a written document could be corrupted and thus preserve error forever this is hard for us to understand we don't even remember things that we don't need to this day because we have them recorded in our phones right here uh, and even on speed dial written materials were expensive back then get this jewish boys used to memorize the entire pentateuch the first five books of moses and this included leviticus and numbers there is someone today who has memorized the entire New Testament. That is hard for us to understand as we have a hard time memorizing a chapter. I'm like, I have a hard time memorizing a verse. 
We don't rely on memory to, transmit, inform to transmit information reliably today. But in ancient world, they would rely on oral transmission more reliably than a written transmission because written transmissions could be destroyed. This care to accurate copying is what led to the destructions of the originals. When a manuscript had been copied with exactitude, and that was confirmed, it was accepted as unauthentic as any other copy. The age of the manuscript was of no advantage to them. In fact, it was a positive disadvantage. A manuscript was liable to become defaced or damaged. So it was a disadvantage because the manuscript was liable to become defaced or damaged in the lapse of time and thus become an imperfect copy. So a damaged or imperfect copy was at once condemned as unfit for use and destroyed, least it be used by people or lest it be used by people. I don't know what mope is. He means um, nope. Nope. Let's see here. I'm not bothered. Spell checker trolled me. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I got lost because my audio went down. Uh, reading back to Kyle. I'm bothered much, but the world has a nasty habit of consistently asking for evidence. I'm bothered much of what is written in the Bible. And when they feel there isn't enough evidence or don't believe what the Bible says, they bash on us. Oh, I'm not bothered. The spell checker trolled me. Gotcha. Now that makes good sense. Uh, we have John in the house. Historically, the state of our evidence, uh, Bible is the best. So I'd say we have it good. Amen to that, brother. And God has preserved it as such. Remember the unreliability of writing materials. A smudge, a mark, a smear, a tear could render a copy illegible. They had not motive to, to preserve it. Why do we need to keep the autograph when we have a copy? That's what they say. Now, I'll give you an, an illustration. I have an old Bible and I replaced it. I don't use the older one. My book knowledge of the holy needs to be replaced. Would I value the older copy over the newer one? No, it's just a copy. I value the newer one because it's easier to use and read. I will scrap the older one. In the case, I in this case, I wouldn't do it because I have a lot of old Bibles and uh, people maintain them. But it's important to understand that this is not what the copyists did. Now, here's a question. Are there errors in those copies? And the answer is yes. Uh-oh. There's errors in the copies? Yes, there are. We know what kinds of errors are made when people make handwritten copies. So we can identify the area, errors. We know how the errors are made. What kind of errors are made. What leads up to those errors being made. And so on. So it's easy for us to identify. They're called textual variants. Words get left out, or word order is switched. Next week, we're going to talk about textual variants. What kinds of errors are made and how those affect manuscripts. Now, as an example in closing, I wanna show you guys on screen an example of that. Now, I know the people in ARC can't see it. I was thinking about trying to build an example out, but I think it would have been more confusing than helpful. But I'll go ahead and bring this up on the screen right now if you want to see it. So what we have here is the original manuscript would be at, without error. The original autograph. So the only son of God. And then copies are made. 100% copies. These were distributed in the uh, Mediterranean era. Now, the third level copy. And this is an example, by the way. This is only an example. Here is one copy that only is missing. Okay, so one copy was made. And instead of saying the only son of God, it says the son of God. But the other copies that were made from the copies did not have that error. So there are other copies that show us that this error was introduced. And we can see that. And so we know the copies that contain the error by cross-referencing them with the older original copies and the other breadth of copies, we can identify this. So as manuscripts were copied, 
errors were copied also. Sometimes then new errors were introduced on top of those. None of these errors, and it's we have a 99.02, something like that, accurate full translation. And the the small, um, the less than 0.1% of errors, we know what they are. And none of them affect our theology, our doctrine, how we are saved, none of thing like that. It's simply errors like this where we have the difference between the only Son of God and the Son of God or something of that nature. Historically, uh, oh, yeah, I already read that one. All right, so that concludes our study. I hope that's helpful to everybody. And um, we are completed, open for questions. This was uh, lesson seven. Next week, we're going to be talking about these textual variants and what they are and how they were identified and how we can be sure that even with these errors, we can still be sure that the word of God we have today has been magnificently preserved by God. It is a divine work that he does, and we can have full confidence in this Bible that we hold in our hands is, in fact, the perfectly preserved Word of God. All right. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. We have a few more moments if anybody has any questions. Anybody? All right. I'm going to go ahead and close with prayer then. Almighty God in heaven, we are so grateful that we can come together virtually for this very real study of the Bible. We are so thankful for the work that you did, Lord, in preserving your word so that we can have it today and be confident of the amazing effort that people have gone through, faithful believers have gone through to um, faithfully preserve your word so that what we have today is your word. We can trust it's your word. We can share your word, teach your word, stand on your word, and we are standing on the truth that is from the mouth of God. We are grateful for this, and we are thankful for the study, thankful for Pastor Jim putting it together and letting us use it, and we pray, Lord, you are glorified through it. And we ask all of this in Jesus Christ's name, our King and Savior. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And. All right. Amen, amen. Oh, we're going to close it. Because I have the AC on. So, I'll shut it out for a second. So, we had uh, 1 Timothy 4.13. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to the exhortation and teaching. That is what we are to be doing. Publicly reading Scripture, exhorting, teaching. For all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17. I guess Mike turned off today. My mic turned off or whose mic? Right. I don't know. All right, we're going to close out with the million dollar question from Ray Comfort's. Um, million dollar bill. This is the million dollar bill dino edition. So will you go to heaven when you die? Have you lied, stolen, or used God's name in vain or lusted, which Jesus said is adultery in Matthew 5, 28? If so, God sees you as a liar, a thief, and a blasphemer, an adulterer at heart. If you die in your sins, you will end up in a terrible place called hell. But there's good news. Though we broke God's law, Jesus paid the fine by dying on the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 Then Jesus rose from the dead and was seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses. He fulfilled all the prophecies of the promised Savior. Please, I implore you today, repent and trust in Jesus, and God will forgive you every sin and grant you eternal life. And we have, one of our signs has been disappeared. The last sign, it's gone. Well, that's the end of the uh, the gospel proclamation. But the last sign said, read your Bible every single day, find a biblically, a biblically sound church to be part of, and 
Uh, if you want further information, you can go to livingwaters.com or check out needgod.com. So yeah, our wooden signs have been degraded. We must fix them. So we need uh, wood, thatch, and fiber. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Bible study. Appreciate everybody being here. And we'll be back next Thursday for Lesson 8. I hope you'll join us.